seated. The weather is spectacular, and I'd like to extend a warm welcome to each of you as we celebrate convocation together. We have convocation each fall to mark the official start of school. This year is particularly a special one. As you may have noticed from all the banners around the quad and on the chapel, the school is celebrating its 175th year. That's a long history, one of the longest of all the other boarding schools in the area. So for my reflection today, I'd like to ask us all to think about our school history, about our own history, and also to think about how the future is simply a history that hasn't happened yet. Yes, we may think we know what this year will bring. We will have our favorite classes and ones where we have to work a bit harder. We will win athletic games and perhaps lose some. We will study for assessments, rest during the breaks, and eventually celebrate with the class of 2016 and our alumni next spring. But although we think we may know what the future brings, here's something to remember. There was a time when Samuel and Emily Williston didn't know they were going to make a fortune out of buttons or start a school. They were just trying to make a good business. There was a time when Dorothy Bement and Sarah Whitaker didn't know that they would change many lives for the better by creating the Northampton School for Girls. They were just trying to be good teachers. All of you are Samuels, Emilys, Dorothys, and Sarahs. You will be asked to live and work with passion, purpose, and integrity this year. You will have choices and maybe some surprising opportunities. You don't know what these moments will bring. I ask you to simply approach them with goodness, kindness, and thoughtfulness, as our founders once did too. As we ring the bell called the Angelus, please sit in silence for a minute or so and think about all of the people and all of the moments in the past that have brought you here and all the people you will meet in the moments yet to come. Let me also note here that the Angelus was presented in 1952 to Northampton School for Girls from the Student Council. On the Angelus are inscribed the words, For Quiet Thought. It was sounded on the Northampton campus every afternoon, at which time all students and faculty paused for a moment of silent reflection. We will now sound the Angelus, and I invite you to join me in a few moments of quiet thought. Thank you. Good afternoon and welcome. Students, classes of 2021 through 2016, and faculty and guests, and a special thank you and welcome to our distinguished speaker, Mr. John Booth, for this, the Williston Northampton School's 175th convocation. And for 2021 and 2020, and your teachers, good on you for just returning from the overnight camp to make it for this opening celebration. Well, everyone, we made it through the first week of school, and now I hope that all new students have begun to see what makes Williston so special and your journey so rich and varied. You will not find a faculty anywhere that is more committed to your personal and intellectual growth, so please join me in showing our appreciation. By now, most every one of you has begun to feel settled at Williston. Your rooms are set the way you want them. Your class schedules have been set by Mr. Talea's dexterity. Day students have trained their parents on when, where, and how they are permitted to pick them up on campus. Your breakfast routine has been set by personal preference or Ms. Marsland's edict. You are feeling or beginning to feel settled and comfortable. So now, just when you thought it was safe to swim in Amity again, my goal for the year is to challenge you to be unsettled. I don't mean undoing all of those important elements I just mentioned, changing your classes, your breakfast regime, or your room. I mean that I want each of you to avoid a mindset of settling in, since that can lead to complacency, or worse, mental laziness. When you think there are no other friends to make at Williston, reach out to someone you have not met. When you start to live in the Williston bubble, 
Pop it. Break outside the insular world that a haven like Williston can become and extend your intellectual curiosity. When you, feel, when you begin to feel comfortable in all of your extracurricular activities, try something completely different. If you can find them, join the Society of Super Secret Things. Why do I say this? I am looking right now at over 400 teenagers. By virtue of your being at Williston, you represent an extraordinarily thin slice of students your age who are afforded the very best educational experience possible. You will become the leaders who solve our most pressing national and global problems. So my challenge to each of you is to ask yourself, what am I going to do with this opportunity? Not to be pessimistic on such a glorious afternoon and propitious occasion, but there are many issues which have my attention. No doubt, you are all aware of the immigration crisis in Europe. As Syria implodes, that country faces a historic exodus of citizens, one of the largest in human history, with half of their population taking flight, many to Europe. No doubt, you are aware of the disaster that befell Charleston, South Carolina, this past June, when a senseless act of bigoted violence wiped out a prayer meeting in the Emanuel African Methodist Episcopal Church, a historic and symbolic black church. How did that act of violence affect me? Well, you won't know this, but my mother and her side of the family are native Charlestonians, and I've been going there my whole life. That church is right down the road from where my mother lives. If you follow the news, then you know that that act of terror visited on Charleston led to the removal of the Confederate flag from the state capitol in Columbia, a hotly contested issue since the civil rights era. The seismic waves of that event stretched all the way to New Haven, Connecticut, where at Yale there is an open forum this year on whether the name of one of their colleges, Calhoun College, should be changed. Why would they change the name of a college after 80-some years? John C. Calhoun, the antebellum senator from South Carolina, was an ardent supporter of slavery. So they ask if his name should be retained at a place that cherishes inclusivity. And why do I bring up Syria and Charleston today? I use these two locations, one from the global stage and one from the national, as metaphors for the extraordinarily complex challenges that face us all today, which, make no mistake, are ones that will be solved by your generation tomorrow. You have the power to make our world better. That power resides within you, and that power has its taproot firmly planted in your education at Williston. Don't miss the opportunity. It's now my pleasure to introduce somebody who doesn't really need an introduction, uh, Nate Gordon, senior class president of the great class of 2016, for his remarks. Thank you, Mr. Hill. Uh, this is my sixth convocation at Williston, so I feel very privileged to be able to take part in this one, uh, which carries so much historical significance for this school. To me, convocation is like a mini-graduation for finishing one week at Williston. <laughs> I think that some of the hardest things we're going to have to do here are already behind us. I mean, if we can figure out if we're supposed to go to lunch one, or lunch two, when we have art history during a green week. I mean, if we can do that, we can do anything in life, right? Anywho, uh, we are here today not only to honor this new school year, but to celebrate the 174 that came before us. All of us here today are carrying on a tradition that began when two people Samuel and Emily Williston decided to use their wealth to found a school that would provide an exceptional place for people our age to begin lives that would impact others. I came to Williston five years ago, and the very first day I was on campus with my new classmates, I walked through that blue door to read on my left when an older student, Pat DiNuccio, a sophomore at the time, said to me, hey, Cool shoes. <laughs> now let me tell you, those high top, bright blue and orange skater shoes were not cool. 
But when that older student spoke to me, my confidence, granted my ego, went through the roof. From that moment, all the way until now, I felt very, very comfortable on this campus. And I, I don't mean comfortable in a comfy, go happy, complacent way. I mean comfortable in that Williston gave me the self-assurance to the next year, in eighth grade, attend a meeting for our school newspaper, The Wilsonian. While I was the only student who showed up to that particular meeting, <laughs> I did manage to get the location and time correct for a few others. So I've been able to spend many enjoyable hours with all the other writers and editors of the paper, along with our unbelievably dedicated faculty advisor, Ms. Mantegna. What these last few years have taught me is that Williston is a place that is big enough so that it offers opportunities for each of us to pursue your passions. Yet, Williston is also a place that is small enough so that if you do pursue those passions, you will make an impact on this community. At the end of the day, each of us is part of something quite a bit larger than any one of us. We're all part of one class. We're all part of one school. But because we are at Williston, we have been given not just the opportunity, but the responsibility to take part in making this school better today than it was yesterday. To go back in time, Samuel and Emily Williston had four children together, all of whom passed away at a very young age due to the lack of modern medicine. I should tell you that our archivist, Mr. Teller, brought, excuse me, inspired me to put any piece of Williston history into this speech. But to continue, after losing four of their own, Samuel and Emily decided to open a school to help the children of other parents become educated and begin lives that would positively impact others. And today, we are the kids, we are the high school students who Samuel, Samuel and Emily provided for because they didn't have their own. And now your parents are the ones who have sacrificed at least something for you all to be here today. Wilson's trustees, Mr. Hill, his administration, have kept the tradition that is Wilson alive today. And the faculty, each teacher on this campus, works every day to create more opportunities for us than most high school students in America ever encounter. So who's left? Well, you, me, us, the students. At this point, it's on us to decide whether or not we're going to make, take advantage of the position we are in by being at Williston. And it's on us to decide how we're going to leave Williston as a better school and community than when we came to it. And right now, it's on us to decide if this 175th year will be better than the previous 174. To make that a reality, Let's not just be here. Let's do something here. Whether you plan on ever coming back to Williston or not after you graduate, in 25 years, when we'll all face the hard truth that our Sammy card can't pay our mortgages, <laughs> in 25 years, I want you to look back at your time on this campus and say, I went to Williston. I did some good things there. So to Mr. Hill, Mr. Booth, and all the trustees, members of the faculty, families, friends, students, most importantly, the class of 2016, thank you for allowing me to take part in this historic ceremony. Great job, Nate. Those are fantastic words for us to all remember. It's now my honor to present the Dean of the Faculty, Peter Valine, for the presentation of faculty chairs.
Thank you, Mr. Hill. It's my privilege this evening to award faculty chairs to two of my colleagues. The first faculty chair is the Charles Gardner Granis, class of 29, and Eugenie William Granis, faculty chair. It was established in 1999 by Eugenie Grant Granis, the, willow, the widow of Charles Gardner Granis. It's awarded to a faculty member who personifies the pure joy of sharing the process of learning. The Grannis Chair recipient walks the halls of the chapel armed with a fly swatter, a copy of Virgil's Aeneid, and an om omnipresent smile. Her passion for the classics is infectious, and her students are injected with a potent dose of the Latin language, history, and culture. She is a true scholar whose intrinsic love of learning is on display each day. And this innate drive has formed a reservoir of knowledge in her discipline that is both deep and wide. Her cheery disposition lights up the classroom and her students quickly recognize the seriousness of purpose and her well-articulated goals. She knows that mastering Latin is difficult so she endeavors to make the challenging work of translation and sentence diagramming fun. She frames the task from a problem-solving perspective, and she asks the students to play the role of modern code breakers. She understands that memory is repetition at intervals, and she continually provides her students the practice they need to master language acquisition. Through the use of creative activities, mnemonic devices, and structural guides, she helps the students through all the linguistic speed bumps. She understands that teaching involves an open and continuous dialogue with her students, and her students appreciate her willingness to receive their feedback and to make adjustments along the way. In this way, she builds a sense of community and a sense of belonging in her classroom. Her students know that they will be supported in a learning partnership that enables them to succeed. Her colleagues appreciate her kindness and her collaborative nature. She's a dedicated educator who is reflective in her practice and fully committed to both her students and her professional growth. I'd like to sum up with the words of one of her students who said, it's plain and simple. Miss Cody is a fabulous teacher who generally cares about her students and stops at nothing to help them achieve. Please join me in congratulating the new recipient of the Grannis Faculty Chair, Beatrice Cody. second faculty chair is the Dennis H. Grubbs faculty chair. It was established in 1999 by the trustees and friends of the school in honor of Denny Grubbs in his final year as headmaster. It is awarded to a faculty member whose life has been Williston Northampton and teaching. While the recipient of the Grubbs faculty chair has not spent his whole life at Williston Northampton, we've been very fortunate to have this talented educator on the faculty for the past 21 years. In this score plus one, he has greeted his students with a wonderful mix of enthusiasm, patience, rigor, and respect. He's a strong role model for all of our students. He brings a balanced approach that recognizes the importance and the urgency of his work, but at the same time, he has a calming presence and a supportive nature that helps his, helps his students maintain a sense of perspective. 
In his time at Williston, he's displayed the ability to connect with language learners at every level of Spanish. And he has enjoyed the reward of observing the progress of Spanish students from Spanish 1 all the way to the AP level. His students appreciate his clear expectations, his knowledge, his fairness, and his sense of humor. He takes the time to understand each student's strengths and weaknesses, and then develops a plan for differentiated instruction through the use of multiple activities. He requires students to be active participants, he frequently checks for understanding, and he uses pos positive reinforcement liberally. We're very lucky to have this native speaker share his knowledge and his passion for language and culture with our community. His colleagues appreciate his dedicated commitment to language learning and his contributions to diversity and global understanding. He's also known for his generosity in helping others, both his students and his peers. His proficiency in language teaching has been recognized by the College Board as he was selected as an AP placement, advanced placement reader and has served in that capacity for many years. He approaches all his responsibilities at Williston with a positive attitude and with a professionalism that is unequivocal. I can't give a better tribute to this re recipient of the Grubbs chair, however, than the kudos given to him by one of his recent students. This tribute may well have come from one of you students in the audience tonight who wrote on a student feedback form last spring, Senor is literally the bomb. <laughs> he hands our work back on time, tells, what, tells us what we need to do to fix our mistakes, teaches us in a way so that we understand what he's talking about, and he's always there to help us. It gives me great pleasure to announce the new recipient of the Dennis H. Grubb Faculty Chair, Eugenio Garcia. Senor, that's high praise, being called the bomb. Our convocation speaker today knows just what I meant earlier by my opening remarks, and for that matter, Nate's remarks, since he models exactly what I'm calling on all you to do. Mr. John Booth graduated from Williston in 1983, earned his bachelor's degree from Williams College, and his master's degree from Fordham University, both in history. He has had an illustrious career at Brunswick School as a history teacher, department head, and now senior administrator serving as academic dean. But behind those various roles and titles lies the essence of what we want for each of you at Williston, the questioning mind and spirit of a lifelong learner. Ask Mr. Booth how it was that he became a scholar of Japanese culture, or what his favorite Japanese rock band is, or about his doppelganger of being a lead vocalist in a rock band, my guess is that the answers to those questions, and many more, trace right back here to Williston, Mr. Booth's alma mater, where he now generously gives his time as a supportive member of our Board of Trustees. It is my very happy pleasure to welcome, as Williston's 175th Convocation Speaker, Mr. John Booth. Headmaster Hill, parents, faculty, staff, students, and friends of the Williston community, thank you for your warm welcome. It is an absolute pleasure to be back on campus to help kick off the start of the school year, Williston's 175th. Nate, by the way, it's not 25 years, but students of Williston, 33 years ago, I sat where you sit today as a new junior to the school. Having no way of knowing, I was going to be completely transformed by
by my two years at Williston. Uh, but before I tell you how Williston changed my life for the better, I've got to address the issue of my name. Think about it. A guy who has the same name as the man who assassinated one of our most revered presidents, Abraham Lincoln, is speaking to you today. Imagine going through your life with the name John Booth. That's not really your full name, is it? Did you shoot Lincoln? Is your middle name Wilkes? And those are just the questions I get from a person I am ordering shirts from at Land's End. As well, with a name like John Booth, it's easy to acquire unsavory nicknames like Shooter, Assassin, and the ever-popular Wilkes. And yet I am proud of my name, for it forced me to be resilient from a very young age. Names are important. They often link us to our family's past or tell us something about our ethnic heritage. The surname Booth, as you might have guessed, is an English name and yet it reveals only part of my background. I am also one half Slovak, something my name does not reveal, yet is so critical to who I am as a person. On February 4th, 1948, my mother, Julia Halinka, came to the United States on the ocean liner Queen Elizabeth. Being a primary source history guy, I know from the ship's list of passengers that she arrived at age 11 from what was then known as Czechoslovakia. She entered the country with her mother and her two sisters. They spoke no English. After having made it through World War II with Nazi officers living alongside her family in my great-grandfather's log cabin, post-war the Russians made life even more difficult for those in Eastern Europe. As the Iron Curtain enveloped the region, my grandparents made the difficult and dangerous decision to get their girls out of the country. They escaped to England and then made it on to the United States. Settling in New York, my mother's first apartment, ironically, was on Liberty Street in downtown Manhattan. Ten years later, she had met my father, gotten married, and started a family. As many did in the post-World War II era, my parents scraped enough money to move out of the city and settle into a small house on Long Island. There, my parents and their four children led the typical working-class suburban life of the era. My dad commuted on the train each day to New York while my mom tried her best to keep us from tearing up the house. There were 50 houses packed in on my street, but tons of kids to play with every day outside and play hard we did. There were some tough times in the late 1970s, during the worst economic times in America since the Great Depression. Construction jobs in New York dried up, and my dad was unemployed for over a year and a half. For a time, we received food stamps, and government issued cheese, eggs, and powdered milk. In fact, the only job my father could eventually land was in Alaska, working on the oil pipeline. At age 15, I saw him only once every few months. In retrospect, those early high school years were difficult ones for me. My hometown of Farmingdale, New York, had one of the biggest high schools in the state. There were over 4,000 students, and it was easy to get lost in the shuffle. But then came Williston. It took a lot just to get here. Williston generously granted me significant financial aid, but I still had to supplement that grant with money earned over multiple summers working as a plumber's apprentice in New York City. I cannot fully divulge how I landed a union job at age 16. <laughs> Suffice it to say, I was told to tell everyone I was 18 and that I had to act 18. Those were interesting summers in the Big Apple to say the least, but that's a story for another day. What a culture shock arriving on this beautiful campus. People said hello when you walked by them, even if they didn't know you. I knew that I wasn't in New York anymore. I eventually adjusted to the two-hour nightly study halls, and the fact my teachers made me read ten times the amount I'd read in public school. 
but oh how I learned and I found out I liked it and was not ashamed to be nerdy. We were required to play three sports at Williston in those days, and although I had planned on playing varsity ice hockey, I also ended up playing varsity soccer, lacrosse, and golf over those two years. You can go into the athletic building in your own free time to laugh at the team photos from 1982 and 83. Lots of hair and short shorts. But I also had the chance to do other extracurriculars like represent the senior class on the discipline committee, build sets for the play, and work lighting during shows. My work study job was to walk the full campus every morning during first period, my only free, and pick up attendance slips from all of the classrooms and bring them back to the schoolhouse. This was the pre-email era. I was given 45 minutes to complete the task, sun, rain, or snow. I was paid the minimum wage at the time, $3.35 an hour. That totaled to a whopping $12.56 a week. And with that money, I did my laundry and hopefully had a few bucks left over to go to the 7-Eleven one night a week after study hall. Still, over my two years at Williston, I both learned how to learn and learned how to love to truly care for people, place, and community, and not to be shy about showing those feelings. I also learned how to be independent, something I truly believe can best be learned by a young teen in a boarding school culture. I grew by leaps and bounds, all because of Williston. Much of that learning came from a faculty just like the one in front of you right now, dedicated Williston legends like Jay Grant, Doc Gow, Ann Vanderberg, Ray Brown, Couchy, just to name a few. In fact, it was Brownie, who's here tonight, who subsequently gave the nickname I still carry today, Boother. Without question, it's a heck of a lot better than Wilkes, all because of Williston. Williston springboarded me to a great college in the most northwestern part of this state, where I played ice hockey for four years, met my wife, and began to learn the craft of the historian, all because of Williston. After college, I left North America for the first time in my life and lived in Japan for two years. I became a fanatic of the country and its culture, especially the food, the language, the ancient city of Kyoto, and contrastingly, the modern game of Japanese baseball, all because of Williston. I returned to the States and pursued a full-time career in teaching. My role models at Williston, those wonderful teachers, made me think I should get into the business. And now, 27 years later, I have the best job in the world. I get to hang out with kids just like you and try to help them reach goals they never thought imaginable, all because of Williston. But now it's your turn. I beg you to take advantage of all this school has to offer. Not just the academics, sports teams, theater, or singing groups, although they will provide you with great experiences. I want you to tap into the soul of Williston. Reach out to the new students and invite them to sit at your lunch table. Help them get to know your friends. Help the kid across the hall who may be a touch homesick. Make sure the day students are as much a part of the place as the boarders. Make all you meet feel as though this is one of the safest places in the world. A place where they can be themselves, take chances, and find happiness. For Williston is as it was when I was a student here. It is filled with people who made career choices to be here for you. All those evenings helping you in the dorm. All those days going the extra mile in the classroom to make, you, make sure you understand the material. And all those late nights and weekends on the road driving vans to and fro. Sure, you will need to be prodded and pushed by your teachers as needed. But ultimately, they are here because they want to be. They are here because of Williston. I started off my speech tonight talking about names, and I will end in similar fashion. For years, the name Williston, in education circles, has been synonymous with the values of caring and authenticity. 
Williston is a place where kids are genuine and empathetic. Be proud of that heritage. You will take the school's names, the school's name and its values with you wherever you go, to your hometown, to your college, and beyond. Make all those who hear the name Williston know it as a place that produces good people with good souls. Thank you for allowing me to say thanks publicly to Williston after all these years. This school means so much to me. And I hope it means that much to you for many years to come. So on behalf of my fellow Williston alums and my current colleagues on the Board of Trustees, I wish you the very best this school year. Thank you. You guys have been a uh, very wonderful audience today, very patient. I know we had a long assembly this morning, and uh, what a way to end, though, with the words that you heard tonight from Mr. Booth um, and also from Nate. And I want to thank Mr. Booth especially for uh, finishing up at school today, getting in the car and racing up here um, to do this, and then turning around and doing some more of the same tomorrow with uh, being, a, being a fantastic fan of all the kids down at Brunswick. Um, so without further ado, I think our next order of business is to stand and sing our alma mater. <laughs>